programs directed by Professor uh, Moen and Ms. Bahi of International Relations. Here with me is Franco Toledo, uh, also a assistant, right? Your official title? Uh, program coordinator. Program coordinator for the Middle East Studies program. And I encourage the students in this class who are interested in becoming part of the program, correct? Uh, to see me, uh, not today, but uh, maybe Tuesday, talk to me. Frank will also bring some of the forms. I'll have them here on Tuesday. And you're welcome to join the center. We uh, encourage, uh, we invite scholars to come and speak to us about timely events uh, all over the Muslim world. And we're in the process of forming a center uh, for Middle East Studies program. And we will be awarding certificates uh, to the graduates of the center. So this is a great opportunity for the FIU students to be a part of something that is big and important, relevant, and it has to do again with Muslim affairs all over the world, in particular in the, uh, the Middle East, but not exclusively limited to the Middle East. Frank. All right, today we're very honored to have Dr. Khalil al Anani, who is a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C., is a leading academic expert on Islamist movements, Egyptian politics, and democratization in the Middle East. He's also served as scholar of Middle East politics at the School of Government and International Affairs at Durham University in the United Kingdom, as a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., and as a senior scholar at Al Aram Foundation in Cairo, Dr. Arlan Nani is the author of many books in both Arabic and English, including two forthcoming books of Packing the Muslim Brotherhood, Religion, Identity, and Politics, and in the Pan Arab newspaper, uh, um, Elections, excuse me, Elections and Democratization in the Middle East. He writes a bi monthly column in the Pan Arab newspaper, Al Hayat and in the Cairo-based Al Aram Weekly, and is a frequent commentator on Arab and international television channels, including Al Jazeera, BBC, Al Arabiya, and Al Urba. This event, the visit of Dr. Al Nani, is co-sponsored by the Ruth K. and Shepherd Broad Distinguished Lecture Series. Okay, so we're honored to have Dr. Al Nani. Dr. Al Nani, please welcome. my gratitude to the uh, Middle East Studies Program. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank Professor Mespahi for inviting me for, for this talk. I'd like to uh, thank Frank, who put the effort to bring me here. And I'm so happy to be here with you today. Uh, as you can see, the talk is about the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt since the revolution, which is the 25th General Revolution, until the coup, which happened in 30. Uh, in 3rd of July, last July. And to start with, I'll just give you a very brief idea about what is the Muslim Brotherhood? What is the character of this movement? What does it want? And what, is, what does it seek to achieve? And very briefly, it is a conservative socio political movement that was established in 1928. And the main goal of this movement was to try to reshape the social and political morals of society to be Islamic, as they understand Islam. The movement started in 1928, and then it was banned in 1954, after a clash with the Nasser regime. And this was uh, during the 50s and led to the ban of the movement during the 50s, 60s, and the beginning of 70s. And then the movement, uh, it, it was banned officially, but its leaders were released from prison, and they started to participate in politics since late 70s and until now. And as you can see, the movement was involved in politics. Uh, they participated in elections in 1984, 1987, 1995, and so on until now. And although they were banned, they were still very effective. They have a very strong social network. 
they are a very disciplined organization, they have very uh, 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 good structure that has been there for at least eight years until now. Over the last 30 years, the movement encountered repression and oppression uh, from Barak regime, which was overthrown uh, uh, on February 2011. So the movement used to operate under repression and oppression. It has a very effective underground network that can function under such kind of oppression and uh, uh, crack down. So this is not something new for the movement. The movement was the main opposition party over the last 30 years. Uh, in Egypt, unfortunately, there is no such strong political party. And the only party, or the only movement, that challenged Mubarak regime was the Muslim Brotherhood. And that's why you might uh, understand the current confrontation between the state and between the Muslim Brotherhood, because it's the only force that can challenge the, the regime. Then, after the 25th of January Revolution, the movement for the first time in its history became legal. And they formed a political party called the Freedom and Justice Party in June 2011. And I'm going to explain how the movement participated in the revolution and how you know, it became, again, uh, an opposition movement. The movement took power after the presidential elections in June 2012 until the coup that happened on 3rd of July 2013. So let's start by looking at the Muslim Brotherhood after the 25th of January Revolution, which uh, toppled the long-standing authoritarian regime of Mubarak. During the first or the early weeks of the revolution, the Muslim Brotherhood Leaders, they were very reluctant to join the revolution. Well, indeed, many Egyptians, they did not believe that a revolution can take place in Egypt. That's why many of political parties did not take part in the demonstrations that were called by young activists who uh, took to the streets and who filled the Tahrir Square, as I'm sure that many of you uh, followed what happened in 2011. So they were the last political party to join the revolution after they became sure that this is not usual demonstration, but rather a massive revolution. That's why they took part in the revolution. And unfortunately, they were the first people to leave the square, to leave the square. That's why there is a statement says that last to come, first to leave. It's about the political situation of the Muslim Brotherhood during the Egyptian Revolution. So you can divide the genature of the Muslim Brotherhood and its attempt to seek power into three main stages. The first one is since they moved from the shadow of Ardex to be the forefront movement in Egypt, and this starts uh, immediately after the removal of Mubarak regime in February 2011 until they uh, won the presidential elections. During that time, the Muslim Brotherhood adopted a very cautious, very self-restrained strategy that they tried not to threat the military, not to threat the, the, the outsiders, or mainly the United States and the Europeans, by claiming that they don't seek power. That's why they declared in the beginning of of the revolution that they don't seek to dominate to dominate the political landscape in Egypt. And they have a very known slogan called participation, not domination, which is some, something that can uh, uh, ease the tension with other political forces. So in the beginning, as I said, they adopted very cautious, very self-restrained strategy. They made alliances, uh, they cooperated were secular and liberal forces in the beginning. They participated in the first parliamentary elections after the revolution, which was in November, December, and January, between 2011 to 2012. And they bargained, 
and, and the Brotherhood, one of its main characteristics, characteristics and features is that they are very good in bargaining. They know how to compromise and how to deal with uh, particularly the military and the state. That's why they started by the end of 2011 to communicate with the military, try to build uh, some connection with them, and to compromise with them. Unfortunately, this happened at the expense of the revolutionary forces. And since that time until now, the gap between the Muslim Brotherhood and between many of young revolutionary forces is widening because many of those who uh, sparked the revolution believe that the Muslim Brotherhood only seeks power and they don't seek to build a genuine democracy in Egypt. At least this is what they think about the Muslim Brotherhood. After a while, the relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and the military became very tense. And they started to uh, uh, confront each other. That's why the Brotherhood decided to seek power and to dominate the political uh, landscape in Egypt. And that's why they started to change the slogan of participation without domination to be uh, 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 domination without, without participation of other forces. So they abandoned their cautious strategy. And this was exactly uh, between January 2012 to April uh, 2012. At the beginning of the revolution, the Muslim Brotherhood announced that they will not participate in the presidential elections. They don't seek to have a presidency in Egypt. And I said this was a message to ease the tension, whether internally or externally. However, after this uh, 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 confrontation with the military, which happened when the Muslim Brotherhood won 47% of the parliamentary elections, and they made alliance with the Salafi movement, and they combined together around 60 Five, 64% of the parliament of, of, the, of the parliament that took place 2011, 2012. So they felt that they are more powerful and they need to press and to seek more power. So they were very power hungry. They shifting their shifting their policy from alliancing, allying and cooperating with secular and liberal forces to start to ally with more Salafi and more uh, uh, conservative. Islamic forces. And unfortunately, when they were in power, particularly uh, in the parliament, they started to contain the revolution by, first of all, uh, trying to cooperate with the Minister of the Interior that used to suppress and repress many activists and crack down on them. And they started to produce uh, some laws that can uh, uh, put uh, limitations on the public sphere and that can prevent people from protesting and from demonstrating. And they have a very uh, uh, negative and bad uh, draft of demonstrations law, which is now is trying to, take, uh, to, to be in a place now by the new interim government, that this law, the main goal of this law is trying to limit the demonstrations and try to narrow the public sphere to prevent any other revolutionary forces from demonstrating against them. And then they clashed with the military. And this was in April 2012, when the movement decided to run for the presidential elections. And this was a turning point within the movement itself, because, as I said before, the movement in the beginning of the revolution announced that they will not participate in the presidential elections, and they don't seek power. But after they tried to make a bargain with the military, and when they failed, they moved and they turned uh, uh, their strategy to focus mainly on how to uh, take power. That's why the Muslim Brotherhood decided to field a presidential candidate. And when, when look at the details on how they took this, this decision, indeed, it was a very dividing issue within the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood has something called the Shura Council, and this is the main body the main exec executive body of the Muslim Brotherhood that has around 108 members and each decision has to be subject of voting of this short council. So during the voting over whether the Brotherhood field a presidential candidate or not, 
the, the division was that 56, 56 members, they were, were fielding a candidate and 52 were, you know, they were against, which can show to what extent the movement was very divided over whether they should uh, feel like candidate or not. And then the, the, the Brotherhood candidate was uh, President Mohamed Morsi. He took power by 51% victory in the elections. And during that time, if you look at uh, the context that the Brotherhood they took power with then, was very fragmented, very divided whether between Islamists or non-Islamists, between uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and secular forces, between uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and even other Islamic forces like Salafis, for instance. So, so when they took power, it was a very divisive movement, movement in Egypt. That's why the Muslim Brotherhood uh, you know, won the elections barely by 51%. Well, in this kind of sort of circumstances, you know, if you come as a president, with this kind of division in the society, the first job that you need to do is try to bridge the gap between uh, different people and try to build some kind of consensus over the democracy process. But what happened is that the Muslim Brotherhood, or President Morsi after he took power, that he started uh, uh, to uh, move away from those who supported him. If you go back and look at how the Muslim Brotherhood, or how Morsi himself took power, this happened in the second round of the elections, where he met with many uh, liberal, secular, and leftist figures, and he agreed on a roadmap that stated that, first of all, Bert Morsi has to appoint uh, uh, a Christian uh, vice president, a woman as a vice president. He needs to formulate a coalition government, or form a coalition government, and he needs to <coughs> reform the Constituent Assembly that was responsible for drafting the first Egyptian constitution after the revolution. However, he did nothing of these things, and he uh, eliminated many of, of his allies, particularly secular and liberal forces. At the same time, and this is the context of, of President Morsi when he took power, that he uh, was faced by the old political structure, the old state, or the deep state, as some people might call it. So, those who were acting on the ground was mainly the Muslim Brotherhood, which used to be called al al Muslim in Arabic, the military, and the deep state. I, by deep state, I mean the network of the businessmen, mm. Many of them, they are corrupt, and they emerged during the Mubarak era, and they were definitely against the revolution from day one, and they were seeking to abort the revolution and try to rebel the old regime and put it in place again. So you had the old power centers, the military, the Brotherhood, and the old deep state on the one hand, and you had a very fragmented, very divided young revolutionary forces, which until now, they could not build uh, a strong political force that can compete or can be uh, the, the third way between the Muslim Brotherhood on the one hand and the military on the other hand. And as, someone, one of, as one of the scholars put it is that Egypt after Mubarak, you know, has something called Mubarakism without Mubarak, that you have the same political structure in place but without Mubarak himself. So you have the Ministry of the Interior, which is corrupt, and adopt a very repressive and very humiliating policy against political activists. You have very corrupt and uh, very aging bureaucracy. You have a high percentage of corruption within this bureaucracy. And you have many economic and social structural problems that any government that would uh, take power would face these issues. And this was, what, this was one of the main challenges that faced Morsi while he was in power. So this is the context that Morsi took power with them, which obviously would lead to many uh, challenges and many uh, consequences. But let's look at first how Morsi acted as a president. What was the performance of the Muslim Brotherhood during his presidency, which uh, took place between June 2012 
for June 2013. First of all, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, although they have the largest uh, uh, number of middle class in Egypt, in terms of lawyers, teachers, doctors, very professional people, but they don't have the statesmen. So they lack the experience of dealing with the governance issue. And this, this was meant one of the main drawbacks, one of the main deficits of the Muslim Brotherhood, that they, they don't have a political elite. They don't have a political class. They only have professional people who can work effectively on the micro level, but not on the macro level. And that's why, because Mubarak himself excluded them. Mubarak, during his 30 years, did not allow the Muslim Brotherhood to not only take power, but even to share power with him. They were in a, uh, whether they were in prison, they were hounded, they were repressed, and they were excluded from having any public office. And when you compare the Muslim Brotherhood to another Islam, Islamic party, or uh, so to speak, in Turkey, the Act Party in Turkey, they had some kind of uh, managerial background and uh, experience in dealing with people problems and issues. But with the Muslim Brotherhood, they, they lack the experience of how to govern and how to rule. So they have some contradictions. For, for instance, after the revolution, many people expected that the Brotherhood, they would turn to be only a political party. That's why one of the main problems of the Muslim Brotherhood, that they until now did not decide whether they would continue as a socio-political movement or a religious movement or a preaching movement, just called Dawah in Arabic, or to turn to be a political party. So they still have this kind of, 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 of conflict between whether to segregate between the political uh, and religious uh, uh, party or, or dimension or to continue like this. And I think this was and it's still one of the main problems and the challenges that is facing the Muslim Brotherhood now. And then, they also have the contradiction between acting and behaving as an opposition movement, on one hand, and as a ruling party, on the other hand. So during Morsi tenure, indeed, you can find many Brotherhood who protest and demonstrate, which was not making sense to us. I mean, I mean how can you protest while you are in power? Okay? This is not the, the job of the ruling party. It's mainly the job of the opposition. That's why they were, you know, confused between acting as a responsible political force and between behaving as a religious and opposition movement. And the, the, the third and one of the most fundamental contradictions between the, between within or under Morsi tenure is that you have a president who came by elections, but at the same time we have the guidance bureau, which is Maktab al Shah, and this is the most effective and important executive body within the Muslim Brotherhood, which consists of or composed from 16 members coming from uh, the, the, the Shura Council of the Muslim Brotherhood. So, on the one hand, you have the presidency, on the other hand, you have the guidance bureau. And many Egyptians did not know. What's the difference between, between both of them? It used to be said that President Morsi himself taking orders from his movement, and he's not, or he was not acting as an independent president for all Egyptians. And this was one of the main problems that faced the Muslim Brotherhood while they were in power. The third point is that, as I said before, yes, the, 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 the Brotherhood, they were in power, but they were not in control. For instance, the first government that was formed under Morsi had only three ministers from the Muslim Brotherhood, and the second had around five, and the third uh, had around seven ministers from the Muslim Brotherhood. None of these ministers, indeed, was this uh, that is called the sovereign ministers, like uh, Ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, was not under the Brotherhood, Ministry of Defense, of course not, because the military has its own independence. Uh, ministry of, uh, of Interior. So the Brotherhood was not, practically was not in control. Yes, they were in power, but they were not in control. They were, are, they, they were faced by the deep state, which is this network of corrupt businessmen who was trying to, uh, uh, to resist any attempt for a change that comes from the Muslim Brotherhood. 
The second point is that even when they, when they were in power, the Muslim Brotherhood did not seek to make any genuine reform in a state structure. And, and one of the main reasons behind this is that the Muslim Brotherhood, by definition, is not a revolutionary movement. It's a very conservative movement. They don't adopt a revolutionary agenda. And it was a pity for them that they take power with this kind of mindset that many people expect that this movement should adopt the revolution's goals and objectives and try to you know, implement them. Indeed, because they are conservative and they don't have the courage to uh, uh, change their mindset, they, their performance was very conservative and they did not seek to reform uh, any of the ministers, at least the Ministry of Interior. And indeed, they did the opposite that they were trying to contain and to continue doing business with them. So for many young revolutionaries, for many young liberals indeed, they believe that the Muslim Brotherhood is trying to only to replace or to put itself instead of Mubarak regime. So nothing genuine will achieve. Okay? And then, as I said, they try to maintain the old structure. For instance, uh, when they made the constitution, they gave a lot of independence for the military. So, so one of the mm, controversial issues here is that the military does not have any kind of civilian oversight, whether on their budget or whether on their internal issues. And one of the things that you should know is that the Egyptian military controls at least 40% of the Egyptian economy until now. And this is one of the main reasons behind the coup that happened in the 3rd of July, as I will explain later. So with this kind of performance and context, you would expect the consequences, which, was, uh, which were very damaging and very telling to what would happen next. So the first consequences of this kind of performance is that uh, during Morsi presidency, he alienated many of secular and revolutionary and liberal forces, but even Salafis. And Salafis, as you might know, is the ultra-conservative movement that adopted, uh, to a large extent, a rigid ideology in terms of understanding religion. Indeed, Salafis, they've proven to be, uh, they have been proven to be more pragmatic and more realistic than the Muslim Brotherhood uh, when they were in power. So, by the end of December, and this was one of the most divi dividing issues that Morsi, on 21st of November, he issued a very controversial constitutional decree that gave him sweeping powers over the judiciary, over the, the parliament, and without any kind of civilian or any kind of oversight over his performance. And this was one of the most dividing points that led to the end, that led to his removal from power. Also, when the Brotherhood were discussing the Constitution, uh, they did not create a consensus over uh, the Constitution. So some people might portray this Constitution as an Islamic. For me, it's not an Islamic at all. It's a very authoritarian, very autocratic Constitution that does not give much freedoms to those who uh, have been killed for the revolution. So that's why Morsi gave him this kind of sweeping powers to protect and to give immunity to the Constitutional Assembly that was responsible for drafting and for writing the Constitution. And they passed the Constitution in a very dramatic way. Within only 48 hours, they made a voting within the constituency and they got the approval of all uh, the articles in the Constitution. And then President Morsi, he signed uh, and he passed the Constitution. The second point is that and instead of allying and operating with the liberal and secular forces, the Muslim Brotherhood, particularly after they passing the Constitution, they started to lean towards more extreme and more radical uh, movements. I'm talking more, mainly about uh, the former jihadists who uh, allied with the Muslim Brotherhood until the removal of Morsi. And then, since December until now, Egypt is witnessing a very profound 
polarization and division. And this division goes across different lines, whether ideological, political, uh, sectarian, as well as religious. So, one of the main reasons behind this is that the Muslim Brotherhood turned the, the political conflict to be a religious one. And those who were protesting against them, they used to portray them as they are anti-Islam. So they turned the issue from being uh, a protest because their political failure to be a protest against Islam, which was one of the main reasons behind the current uh, polarization and division uh, in Egypt. And one of the main problems, one of the main uh, consequences of this bad performance is the misperception of the Muslim Brotherhood. And I'm going to give you a very practical example about this. I went to Egypt last, last June, and I spent the whole summer there after spending five years in, in the UK, and I went to spend, uh, you know, to get some relief. Uh, but um, in fact, it wasn't relief at all. I mean, I went during June until September. So I met with some of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood leaders before the, uh, the massive demonstrations that took place in June 30. And I asked one of them, his senior leader within the Muslim Brotherhood, what is your expectations about what would happen in 30th of July and 30th of, of June? What would the Muslim Brotherhood react? How would you react to this kind of massive uh, uh, demonstrations? And the answer was that we will do nothing. I said, why? And he said that because the people or people will, will protect us. I, I mean, and I felt that this guy is very disconnected. He was out of touch. I mean, people that you're talking about is going to demonstrate against you. And you are saying that these people would, would protect us from these demonstrations. So they had a lot of underestimation to what's happening in Egypt. I'm talking mainly about the situation before 30th of June. It's a the massive demonstration that took place, and they were calling, were, were calling mainly for an early presidential elections. And after these massive demonstrations took place on 30th of June, it came the military coup. Well, here is a very controversial uh, uh, issue over whether we should call it as uh, a second wave of, of the revolution or a coup. Well, we need to differentiate between what happened on 30th of June and what happened on 30th of July. Or 30th of June, as I said before, massive demonstrations, which also the number is very controversial. Some people, they claim that it was 33 million people, which I laid down this number. Uh, well, I was in Tahrir Square in 30th of June, and I saw many people there. And I would say that maximum, by maximum, you can talk about 300,000 people, nothing more than this, frankly. But anyway, I mean, beyond this kind of controversy over the number of people who took the streets during that day, is that the main demand for those who uh, went to the streets on 30th of June is to ask for an early presidential elections. What happened on 3rd of July is a totally different issue, that the military gave 48 hours for President Morsi to respond to this uh, demand. And he, when he did not respond, they uh, issued a uh, roadmap and they imposed it on Egyptians. And this roadmap uh, stated that the, the Constitution, well, first of all, that the head of the Constitutional Court should be a president, as, a, as an interim president. Second, the Constitution should be suspended. Third, the solving the Parliament, which is mainly it was the Shura Council, which came by a very small uh, vote and to uh, uh, dissolve the government, and to form another government. And this was totally different from what people asked for in 30th of June. That's why, and then if you look at the, the, the events that followed this 30th of July, first of all, they put President Morsi under house arrest. Second, they arrested many of, ex, of the Muslim Brotherhood leaders, which is still until now in a prison. Third, they uh, uh, shut off and shut down many of the uh, uh, pro-religious media channels, which is still until now uh, shut down. Third, they started a very heavy uh, 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 
and the policy against anyone that might belong to the Muslim Brotherhood. So if you, as a political scientist, or as students, indeed, this is a very textbook coup that happened in Egypt on the 3rd of July, which no one can debate over there. <laughs> so, what happened after the coup? Or the Muslim Brotherhood after the coup? Well, as they used to be, in terms of misperceiving what's happening around them, they went in a very big disarray, confusion, and paralyzed. Because the first time leaders were in the prison, the regime or the, the new interim government arrested uh, many of the members of the guidance bureau. And I said before, the guidance bureau, Maktab al Shah, is the main executive body of the Muslim Brotherhood. So if you arrest many of them, you mean that you can paralyze the movement because there is no communication between the grassroots base uh, uh, and between the leaders. Second, the uh, movement did not provide any political vision or initiative on how to resolve the issue with the regime, or with, mainly with the military. Indeed, one of the main items here that the Ministry of Defense that made the coup against Morsi, he was handpicked of Morsi to be Minister of Defense. And people are talking about that Morsi picked him to be Minister of Defense, and his name is General Sisi, as, as you might know, that because he was, he was a pious, a religious person. So even the selection of Morsi for, for, for the Minister of Defense was based not on, on qualifications, or merits, but mainly on the religious background of the Minister of Defense. So, and instead of adopting uh, uh, an effective political strategy, they adopted what I'm called as the Mehna narrative, which is the ordeal narrative, which is victim, victimhood. And this is a very good way for the Muslim Brotherhood to maintain support and to maintain solidarity of its grassroots. So one of the reasons behind keep, keeping protesting and demonstrating now is try to prevent any internal attacks or fractures or, or, or division within the movement. So by uh, 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 calling for the reinstating Bruce Morsi, they would guarantee that the whole movement is united behind this goal. So trying to uh, invest in this kind of victimhood. And they used to do that over the last 30 years, by the way. One of the main reasons behind the appeal and the popularity of the Muslim Brotherhood is that they used to invest in the repression of the regime by portraying themselves as victims of this kind of repression. Although the popularity of the Muslim Brotherhood declined significantly during the, the, the one year in power, now they're trying to rebuild this kind of popularity based on this kind of ordeal or mehna narrative, as they call it. And then they made this kind of sit-in, Rabah and Nahda, which you know, I visited five or six times, by the way. And they spent 45 days calling for reinstating President Morsi and for you know, resisting uh, the coup, which, end, which ended up as one, you know, many of you might know, but this kind of brutal and bloody dispersal of the sit-ins that happened on 14th of August, which left at least 2,000 people were killed, around 5 to 6 or 7,000 people have been arrested until now. Uh, many of them in, in, indeed have been burned uh, when, when they, 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 they uh, stay alive. So it was a very brutal massacre that happened to them on 14th of August, which led to the creation of this kind of a slogan that they call this drama slogan when they, you know, uh, praise their four fingers. And this is another symbolic issue that can unite them and bring them together. Uh, I would say that what happened on 14th of August is a turning point and the most important about the strategy and tactic and discourse. Because now it's not only a political issue for them. It is something about revenge. It's something about that 
There is no reliance when it comes to human rights. And this something is very dividing now in Egypt, which is very upset and annoying. When you find some people who justify killing the Muslim Brotherhood members because they deserve it. Okay? And that's how the military is keeping going back by killing and arresting many of Muslim Brotherhood leaders. Well, you can be anti Muslim Brotherhood, politically speaking, but you cannot, if you have a sense of humanity, to justify the killing. Okay? However, you can find this in Egypt right now. Particularly those who are so called liberal and secular forces, unfortunately, now they are back in the military and they are justifying uh, the, the, the heavy crackdown, the heavy crackdown of the regime against the Muslim Brotherhood. One of the main goals of, of the current heavy-handed policy against the Muslim Brotherhood by the state is trying to create divisions within the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, one of the main people who are now, now negotiating with the state, uh, I called him a month ago to ask him about, so what is the solution? What is the political vision of the Muslim Brotherhood on how to resolve the current crisis? And he said that the regime is trying to co-opt some of us and to contain them by saying that, look, I mean, we have this conservative generation that is now in prison and you are supposed to be a reformist, so why not just forget about them and let's do business together? So one of the main goals now of the current regime is trying to create divisions within the Muslim Brotherhood. So now we can, we can talk about uh, the, the state or the military strategy with the Muslim Brotherhood. To what extent the, the current regime is willing to include them or to exclude them. Well, indeed, what's happening now is an, is an attempt, attempt to eliminate and to exclude the Muslim Brotherhood and to uproot them. And I would expect this attempt to fail. Well, Nasser, during the 50s and 60s, he tried this and he failed. Mubarak well, did the same thing, but he failed. Why? Because we are not talking about, it's not simply a religious, a religious movement. It's a very massive social movement that has at least, and there is no official record for the numbers of the Muslim Brotherhood, but we are talking about at least 500,000 people who have a very uh, passionate and very uh, uh, committed ideology uh, to Islam. And they are willing to die for this. So they have a cause, whether we agree with this cause or not. That's why what's happening now is useless and very costly, not only for the Muslim Brotherhood, but even for Egyptian transition and, and for the future of democracy in Egypt. So the current attitude within the state is to approve and eradicate the Muslim Brotherhood but through, uh, through what, something, what they call as the war in terrorism. And now they try to portray the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. And you can find many of whether the official media or even the private owned media that is now pro-military trying to uh, demonize the Muslim Brotherhood and even dehumanize them by portraying them as a violent organization. And the violent, the violent issue of the Muslim Brotherhood is something very controversial. However, for someone like me, who started this movement over the last 15 years, I would say that they renounced violence a long time ago. Okay, so anything about that this, that this movement has violence agenda, uh, or the adopt violence is something, I would say, misleading and uh, simply false. Yes, you can find some uh, true Brotherhood members who might adopt fanatic discourse, might adopt extreme ideology, but you cannot talk about uh, uh, a strategic decision by the Brotherhood leaders that they want to be uh, violent or to use uh, armed forces against the state because, uh, first of all, you know that if they use violence, it would be a useless uh, uh, strategy. Second, they would lose a lot of their public support if they turn to be violent. So, they know, you know, practically speaking, and even ideologically, that they don't believe in violence as my people might portray them. Now, the question is what would be the impact of the current repression? against the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, indeed, this is a very open-ended question that no one could answer it. It can lead to some kind of radicalization, 
the sum of young people can turn viral. And this, this is typically what happened in the 1950s and 60s is when it led to the creation of what they call the Cotbist ideology. And this is a, uh, uh, Cotbist ideology, ideology refers to the, the, the emergence of uh, uh, one of the main ideologies and theorists of the world called Said Qutb, who uh, uh, published a very known book is called Milestones, and it used to be a manifesto for jihadist and radical movements around the world. So one of the main consequences, one of the main unintended outcomes of the current generation is to radicalize some of the young members of the Muslim Brotherhood. We don't know yet if this happened or not, but it can happen if this kind of uh, aggression uh, continue in the future. The second uh, uh, scenario is to the extent the current, the current repression can lead to some kind of revision. Again, guys, you need to remember that when the military took against the Muslim Brotherhood, they did not do that because they are only religiously, religiously rigid movement, but because they were terrible in terms of political performance. That they, 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 they mishandled many of socio-economic and political issues after the revolution. That's why they turned against them. So to the extent the current repression can push the Muslim Brotherhood to adopt some kind of revision and uh, restructuring to the movement. And if you look at the movement, because we don't have much time to talk about the internal dynamics of the movement, but indeed you cannot talk about a strong reformist current in the Muslim Brotherhood. It's mainly dominated by conservative and old guards. The question is, to what extent the movement can now restructure itself to become more moderate and progressive? And that's a big question. Indeed, it's very uh, hard to believe or to assume that this will happen under repression. Usually, it happens through what they call the inclusion uh, and moderation thesis, which I'm, I'm personally I'm against this kind of thesis, but you cannot expect some person or some people to be moderate while you are repressing them and hounding them. Because, I mean, they would react to this in different ways. And this poses the question of the future of the Muslim Brotherhood and whether the movement would disappear, vanish, or uh, abandon politics and just you know, focus on religious activities. Well, I would say that the, 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 the movement would remain as it is now, as a political movement, and it would continue these demonstrations and to create uh, problems for the current regime. And uh, frankly, I don't see any way out from the current situation because the, what's happening is that the current political game turned to be a zero-sum game that you didn't have such situation that it can be called one-one situation. It's whether the military when the, the, the current confrontation or the Muslim Brotherhood, which I doubt that they would do. Now, let's go beyond, and this is the, 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 the last uh, slide, let's, let's go beyond the Muslim Brotherhood and look at the future of Egyptian democracy. And as political science students, you might expect that uh, it didn't happen before that coups lead to democratization around the world. In very exceptional cases, I would say. Uh, but, generally speaking, you cannot expect that the military, which took power through some sort of coup, that they are keen to build democracy. I really doubt this would happen in Egypt. And there are many signs that Egypt is heading toward this uh, more unstable, uh, more unstable and more uh, 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 turmoil in the, in the coming future. If the current interim government did not produce uh, any uh, genuine democratic plan, which obviously they, 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 they don't. Now, a very interesting phenomenon in Egyptian, Egyptian politics is the rise of General Sisi. And General Sisi is the guy that, according to, many, according to uh, his supporters, that he saved Egypt from the Muslim Brotherhood and from Islamists. And now he is the savior. And indeed, the rise of the General Sisi reflects the failure of the civilian or the civil elite in Egypt, the so-called liberal and secular forces. Well, indeed, if, if these forces, they are really competent, they should, have, should, they should have benefited from the current situation, but there is no Islam anymore, so they should have organized themselves and try to uh, provide an alternative 
for instances. But now, you can find this very common now in Egyptian media, that many figures of liberal and secular elite, they are supporting General Sisi for presidency. They are pushing him and urging him to run for a presidency, which is something very ironic when it comes to talk about democracy or building a civil state. So I would expect that even might reverse back, <coughs> might return to excuse me, some sort of hybrid authoritarianism in terms of you will not have such kind of uh, 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 very autocratic regime, but you will have something close to what Mubarak used to have. That you can have uh, regular, regular elections, uh, you have some extent uh, uh, political freedom when it comes particularly to the media. But what's now in place is that you have martial law, emergency, or state of emergency. Uh, uh, now there is a talk within the, they have 50 members constitutional assembly that is now revising the constitution of 2012 and trying to uh, amend it. And there is a, a lot of debate over to give impunity for Ministry of Defense for at least 12 years. So General Sisi himself is trying to get this kind of impunity, which reflects to what extent he has a, a, a problem with the Muslim Brotherhood. And he, I mean, he, he has some fears of that he might be uh, persecuted because the crimes that happened over the last uh, uh, three months. Another controversial issue, what's happening now in Egypt within the Constitutional Assembly, is that uh, the military trial of civilians, and under this uh, uh, boogeyman of the war terrorism, the military is trying to justify everything. So now Egypt is caught between, and this is, used to be the game between democracy and stability, which indeed we would end up with, you know, nothing of them. We would not have stability, or we would not have democracy. And this used to be the case over the last 30 years, by the way. Mubarak himself tried to convince the West that I am the only guarantor for stability. So please, you know, keep yourself silent or keep your eyes closed on what's happening in terms of human rights, freedoms, because I, I am responsible for bringing stability to the country. Well, what's happening now in Egypt is far away from stability. It's a very, very unstable country. You have everyday violence, and violence, violence turned to be a norm in Egyptian political life. So it's not something exceptional. The country, as I said before, very divided over many issues, whether religious, political, or even uh, uh, social issues. What makes me a bit optimistic about the future is this is the people agency that those who took the streets over the last uh, three years might do it again if the military tried to reproduce the, uh, the, the authoritarian regime of Mubarak. So this might give us a slight hope that at some point, we don't know when, Hopefully this will, this will not take long, that people would say no, we need to stop this, and we need to move forward to build a genuine democracy in Egypt, and I hope this will happen soon, and I will leave it there, and thank you for your listening. We have about uh, 10 minutes for a question and answer. Uh, I don't have a mic here, but if you stand up and you can project your question, Loudly and clearly, Professor Ross, we only have 10 minutes of question and answer, and I'll uh, we'll let you out early. Uh, any questions? Okay, why don't you come up here and ask the question from here so he can understand what you're saying. And those who are asking questions, please line up behind him, right here on this side, so you can ask the question. Right there. Well, I don't, I don't know where to go. Um, what about people in Sinai, the military that was being killed all the time? What about Muhammad ibn Sagi who was in, in Rabah and he claimed that only those attacks would stop after Morsi came back to power? What about when during the elections they didn't say anything about that? When they were giving up uh, rights to the oil and they were taking people's IDs and writing down their names? I was in the Hadayah on like 30th of June 
And we sat 30, first, second, third, four days of protesting. People were like happy when more still up. We celebrated all night. I, mean, I did. I'm not, I did celebrate. I'm not for CC for president, but they weren't going to help anyone. They were there to kill us. Yes. You mind restating the question? Yes, yeah. please. <coughs> Can I ask you now or take questions for us? Oh, you can answer. Okay, great. Right. Well, you raised many, many, many points here. Let's let's take it one by one if we have time. About Sinai. Sinai is a very controversial issue now. And uh, to make the link between the Muslim Brotherhood and Sinai is very misleading to be frank with you. Sinai is an underprivileged area that has been uh, 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 protesting over the last, I would say, six or seven years. And that's why it was the military, and before the military, the, the, the Minister of the Interior uh, cracked down on people there. Uh, one thing that you might need to know about Sinai is that if you are a Sinai person, if you, are, if you live in Sinai, you don't feel that you are so loyal to the central government in Egypt. Why? Because Sinai doesn't have such kind of development. There is no proper education, there is no infrastructure, there is no uh, social and economic uh, uh, benefits for people who are living there. But even more than this, that if you are a Sinai, mainly if you are, I mean, I don't know if you are, you know Sinai, Sinai is the, the east part of Egypt, around, I would say 20% of Egyptian land is in Sinai, it's a peninsula. Uh, uh, so, if you are a Sinai person, if you live in Sinai, and was born there, it's very hard for you to get an Egyptian ID. So can you can you imagine your feeling towards the state that you are supposed to be a citizen within it and you don't have an ID? So it's very problematic. So there are many grievances that's happening in Sinai. So but to make the link between what's happening in Sinai to the Muslim Brotherhood, yes, you can find some people who they are uh, radical Islamists. And by the way, some Sinai is a lawless area that there is no such uh, security or state control over this massive land. So you can find a combination of former jihadists, Salafi jihadists, and you can find also those who are, you know, working on human traffic as well and drug uh, uh, issues. So it's 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 very hard. I mean, there is no tangible evidence that there's a link between the Muslim Brotherhood and between the uh, between what's happening in Sinai. Yes, those who are in Sinai try to benefit from what's happening in Cairo, right, to attack the army which by no means is unacceptable. The second point about, um, about the Tahadir. And the Tahadir, this is the presidential palace that many Egyptians took, took to it in 30th of June, and they celebrated the removal of Morsi. As I said before, I don't want to for in 30th of June. So I was against Morsi for political reasons and for many things. But what happened in 30th of June, as I said before, different from what happened in 30th of June. As I said, the main goal, the main demand of people on 30th of June is try to call for early presidential elections. Right? They did not call for you know, changing the course and pushing the country towards you know, a bleak and I would say dark era like what's happening now. So, again, uh, if you are a genuine democratic person, if you are a genuine democratic person, you would stand against what's happening now in Egypt. Okay? It, it by no means leads to democracy. I mean, Forget about the Muslim Brotherhood. It's beyond the Muslim Brotherhood now. That they, 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 they failed, and they are paying the price of their failure. But now, if you look at what's happening now in Egypt, it doesn't you know, lead to any uh, kind of general democracy. All right, next question. Um, Brother Leshi, you had mentioned uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Leaving in and out. Originally, it was a social movement. And it, was, it was kind of leaning towards getting into politics and back and forth. And how would you describe the, the makeup of the, of the brotherhood? Is it middle class? Mm -hmm. Is it intellect? Uh -huh. uh, is it probably amongst the uh -huh. poor Egyptians? Okay, it, it's mainly it's mainly middle, lower lower middle class and upper middle class. I would say this is the main I would say the main uh, uh, structure of the Muslim Brotherhood that. Uh, teachers, lawyers, doctors who belong to the uh, lower and middle, middle uh, classes, they, they used to be the main bulk of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Brotherhood, they have a very good mechanism on recruiting people in this kind of areas. So they start with people in universities, 
in high schools and try to recruit them. That's why the majority of them they belong to the middle and lower middle classes. Okay. Uh, the last question. Go ahead. Uh, I got a, I got a question, but I have multiple uh, segments. Uh, first, first of all, uh, <coughs> scale one to ten, how how radical or extreme you think uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood are? And the second one, why why? Uh, uh, since the start of Arab Spring, we see that Islamization of the revolution, and uh, why, for comparison to the independence from from the uh, Western Black colonization, mm -hmm. like the French and the English and the Italian, and also, um, isn't it the, the coup against Morsi would have saved uh, Egypt from being another Iran uh, uh, being controlled by? Uh, okay. Well, for the for the first the first point, I like to put the Brotherhood from one to ten in terms of violent. You said violent or extreme. Right. I would say put it at zero level, Frank, based on uh, my studies with them over the last fifteen years. Okay. Generally speaking, they don't believe in violence. They are comparing to other movements at least. They are very moderate. As I said, as I said before. The main problem was the Muslim Brotherhood was not only religious, or was not religious per se, it was mainly political. That they failed politically. They could not govern effectively. If you compare this idea, the Brotherhood discourse and ideology by Salafists, for instance, by radical Islamists, no comparison. So I would, I would put them that in zero scale. Second point about what extent the Muslim Brotherhood tried to Islamize Egypt, I would say. I didn't see any sign about this, frankly. It's not the case of Iran. It is not the case of, I would say, Pakistan under the al 1979 or late 70s. It is not the case under, uh, in Malaysia, under Mahathir Muhammad, when he tried to impose Islamization of, of, of indeed what the Brotherhood did. And this made many Islamists, or I mean, right wing Islamists, upset from them that they were adopting uh, uh, not secular policies, but they did not. Implement, for instance, Sharia law when they took power. Okay, they were dealing with the IMF, trying to get a loan from it with interest. And you know, interest is 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 ocean. It's 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 it's, it's rubbed in Islam. So they did not adopt any you know different strategy or policy from what used to be under uh, uh, under Mubarak. To what extent the military saved Egypt from the Muslim Brotherhood? Well. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, mean, I don't think so. I don't think. I think Egypt were, were heading not towards theocracy, but towards some kind of failure. So yes, this might be true that the, the military uh, did its best as they did under Mubarak, when Mubarak was toppled. But if you look at the behavior and the discourse of the military over the last three months, it doesn't give any signs that they are taking Egypt to democracy. Okay, so it, they might have saved it from another cycle of failure, but the challenge is that to what extent they cannot, or they should not reproduce this kind of failure in the future. Thank you very much.